Hi, my name is Medio DeMarco. I'm a co-founder of Delphi Digital. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about the you know, financial innovation and experimentation happening in the DeFi space. Now, before we talk about the future of finance, I think it's important to have a you know, grounding in the, the history of finance and what that's meant for uh, society and uh, you know, advancement in uh, economics. Now, really, modern, uh, modern markets start with the Dutch uh, in, the 16, in the 17th century, uh, the golden age of the Dutch Republic. Uh, don't worry, this isn't going to be a presentation on tulip mania or uh, you know, the history of money. Um, but what I wanted to hit on here is with the Dutch Republic, um, there was a lot of things coalescing that allowed all this financial innovation to happen. Um, you know, during that time period, um, you know, one good question would be, you know, why didn't this type of innovation happen in a country like Spain that had all the you know, newfound wealth from uh, the Americas and all of their trade? What made the Dutch Republic so unique and that led to uh, you know, creation, uh, the creation of things such as the stock market, derivatives, insurance markets, etc.? And if you actually look at history, uh, there's really three things that helped enable the financial innovation of this period. One was a very decentralized political government. Um, you know, you contrast this to other European states at the time, where you have Spain, France, etc. Uh, it's typically, you know, one monarch, uh, an autocratic rule, and the entire economy of a country is basically shaped around, you know, supporting the king and supporting the lords. Uh, the Dutch Republic was much more decentralized, and uh, that was a huge part of, uh, you know, setting up their fiscal system and their economics. Uh, it also got regular people involved. Uh, you know, banking and trade goes back millennia, but it was the Dutch Republic that really, uh, you know, got everyday people from craftsmen to the baker to, uh, you know, the people that would pave the roads. They were also investing in financial assets for the first time. Uh, and this, you know, sparked uh, things like the tulip bubble where, you know, for the first time you had uh, just everyday people buying up these assets and, you know, trying to invest their money. Uh, it was a big advancement in publicly funded debt as well. Uh, you know, prior to this period, you know, if a government wanted your money to fund their stuff, they would just tax it and take it, uh, usually by force. Uh, but with the Dutch Republic, they actually tailored their debt offerings to the people, and uh, it was a much more uh, modern system of uh, consent, rather than we're going to take uh, the money that we want. Uh, and it was also uh, based in, you know, good, um, good legal system and uh, laws that were enforced. And I think you can draw a lot of parallels from that period to today, where you know, instead of having a de decentralized government running the country, you have a decentralized network, uh, which is, you know, breaking up control. Uh, instead of having good laws, we have code. Code is law. And really, the thing that excites me about DeFi is the amount of people that it brings into the fold. It really boosts financial inclusion, as well as, uh, you know, just uh, helping. The more people you bring in, then the, less, uh, the more permissionless it is. Uh, the faster you can experiment, the more you can iterate, and we can get some pretty cool products that uh, really come out of nowhere. And you know, going off the theme of you know decentralizing control of, over the over economics, you know, if you really were to put this on a spectrum, uh, you know, to the far left you have central planning and autocratic control of an economy where uh, one entity decides all of the uh, the economics for a system. And if you look at history, this has literally never been a good idea. Whether you look at the Soviet Union, Mao's China, you could look at North Korea right now, et cetera. On the other side, you have capitalism. Now, capitalism isn't perfect, certainly has its flaws, but it's a pretty good system. It's why we're all here today. And really at the core of capitalism is, like, what is capitalism? What makes it such a better system than you know, having one entity tell you what to do, telling you how to plan an economy. And really, it's just an incentive-based system that enables anybody to have an economic impact. You don't have to walk into a store and you know, take home the one shirt they have. You get to make a decision. If you don't like the products, you can go launch a company and you can compete. And that's really important and has led to you know, a lot of, um, you know, it's really advanced society and brought about a lot of significant change on that part. Now. Now that we've kind of like laid the groundwork for financial innovation, why it's important, um, one thing I also wanted to say was, so the outcome of all the financial innovation from the Dutch Republic was, uh, you know, that infrastructure that it put in place, that allocation of capital, uh, it might sound kind of boring that, you know, you have stocks and you have, um, you know, forex markets and insurance markets and all of these things start to develop, 
but the way that impacted the economy in the future was very important. So if you look at things like the Industrial Revolution, which really came about 150 years after you know, the glory days of the Dutch Republic is really when it started to get founded, uh, that wouldn't have been possible without these complex financial markets to diversify risk, more efficiently allocate capital. You know, building factories, that's expensive. Building machinery, that's expensive. Without this type of um, you know, more complex financial system departing from the past, uh, none of this would have been possible. So now that we have a grasp on you know, the history of financial innovation and you know, how it's kind of helped mold society moving forward, why don't we take a look at current markets? And I think you could argue, I mean, I don't need to explain to this crowd how decentralized networks can, you know, advance, uh, uh, can advance financial markets. Uh, that's why we're all here. But it does beg the question, are financial markets in need of reinventing? And I think if you look around the world right now at the current global macro la landscape, the answer is pretty, cl pretty clear yes. And I can explain this, uh, I think the best way to explain this is using uh, an example, which is uh, going to be a government bond. Uh, raise your hand if you have a favorite government debt issue from 2019. No, that's okay. That was surprising. Uh, so no one, because no one, no one really tracks this stuff, right? Um, so just to kind of like dumb down bond math, because it's very complicated and doesn't always make, it's not always intuitive. Uh, I'm going to give you a scenario. You let me know if you would buy this. You pay me $154 today. Over that lifespan, you're going to earn 1.17%, which is less than inflation, so you're already losing money. And then in 98 years, I'm going to give you $100 back. Would you be excited to invest in that? Like, would you give me your money? You'd probably be asking yourself, like, who, who's buying this shit? Like, who would sign up for a 100-year bond where I'm going to lose money? Well, you'd probably be pretty surprised that this was a hot bond issue. Uh, from Austria that was four times oversubscribed. So basically, you had four times more demand for this bond than they could even fill. They ended up selling a few billion dollars worth in this tranche. And there's a few reasons for this, even though it doesn't sound like it makes sense. One, you have pensions in uh, Europe and abroad that in their investment mandate have to invest a certain amount of their portfolio into uh, safe sovereign credits, in which case Austria is uh, one of the best. But on the flip side, you also have some like bond trading trickery where based on bond math, uh, as yields fall, prices rise. Because these bonds are ultra long duration, low coupon, uh, this actually plays out in a more extreme form where if you expect, if you expect rates to uh, be continue being cut, this, the price of these bonds is gonna skyrocket. Uh, so what you do have is you have this intense bidding war for debt instruments that don't even really make sense anymore. Now, one of my first jobs out of college was working at Bloomberg where I covered financial data for U.S. corporate bonds and treasuries. And I remember uh, during my first year on the job when a certain type of corporate bond went negative for the first time and the computer like literally just broke. Uh, and the reason for that is when they designed the system years ago, they basically floored the limit at zero because the thought of a negative yield was just inconceivable. They're like, what do you mean? Like, you're gonna charge a lender for giving you money, you're gonna charge a saver for saving money. It just didn't seem possible. All that stuff is really coming to a head right now and it's only getting bigger. If you look at you know, a commonly cited number, which is a new record, which is pretty interesting, uh, there's $17 trillion of debt right now that's negative yielding. So you actually lo lose money lending to them. Uh, and a lot of that plays into this, a lot of that plays into economic stimulus and trying to jumpstart economies, uh, but that's not really working. So this isn't to say that one bond issue necessitates the reinvention of finance, and it's certainly not to say that Ethereum is gonna solve some sovereign debt problem, but I do think it depicts kind of the weirdness that's going on in the markets right now, where you know traditional approaches and uh, mechanics are kind of breaking down at a time where you know, we're coming off 10 years after uh, you know, the financial recession, uh, QE is only getting ramped up more, we're really coming to a head with a lot of the way that you know, the prior market had been structured. And I think it's a really good time to explore uh, you know, new solutions and new ways to structure it. Now, uh, to the left, what I'm showing is a diagram of compound. Uh, these are all the smart contracts, these are how they interact. Uh, and this can be audited by anyone in the world anytime they want. It's totally transparent infrastructure. To the right, 
it's, you have the same level of uh, public accountability for Goldman Sachs. It's a total black box. And it's in that black box that financial risks arise. Uh, back in 2008, people didn't know how you know, risky the financial, the financial sector had become because you just, there was no easy way to tell. Sure, individual banks had some idea of the risk on their books, even though they underestimated it themselves, and maybe in isolation they would have been fine. But it was when you combine that with the rest of the financial se uh, sector that uh, it became systemic. And you know, that type of problem can't really be possible if you build uh, you know, public, publicly transparent infrastructure on a blockchain like Ethereum. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's really important. Uh, after I worked at Bloomberg, I worked, I worked at Deutsche Bank in their, uh, I was covering derivatives exposure for the hedge fund clientele. And you know, I was always surprised by you know, the, inefficiency, the operational inefficiencies, uh, incorrect data, mistakes. The financial markets were just a lot messier than I think I expected them to be coming out of college. And as all young workers do, eventually I became disillusioned and I thought, I would think to myself, like I know technology is going to come in and it's going to reinvent this. I'm not sure how, I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but there's just no way that you know, these you know, pointless meetings, PowerPoints, phone calls, like how is this ever going to stand up against you know, a supercomputer from the future? And at the end of the day, all finance is, is math. So uh, once I stumbled across Ethereum and I kind of went down that rabbit hole, I was like, this is the technology, this is how you can apply it. And if you build a financial system on top of it, uh, you have a level of transparency that is unparalleled today. Uh, one risk that you know, people often cite in DeFi is the idea of you, know, you get a smart contract bug in um, you know, Maker, and that you know, cascades through the ecosystem, wiping everything out. And that's a fair critique, and we'll probably see some stuff like that happen. It's just reality. But I do think once we get to a mature phase, and you have a lot more stuff built out, and you have a lot more scrutiny where it's supposed to be, and we've kind of done the trial and error to learn what has to happen for things to be safe, there is just no way that a system built on top of Ethereum, a, fin a financial system built on top of something like Ethereum, could uh, not be an improvement over just the black box siloed databases of today. Okay, so now I'm gonna start talking about DeFi, but before we do, a quick recap. Financial innovation is good helps people. Uh, in economics, decentralized decision-making has always produced better outcomes. Uh, three, global financial markets are really weird right now. And four, we can build a new economy on decentralized networks that boost financial inclusion or more efficient and uh, you know, just generally better in a lot of ways. So this is a great picture from Alethio. Honestly, I'm not really sure what it's showing me right now, but that's fine. I'm just gonna kind of ramble on a few topics. Uh, so of all the DeFi protocols, I would say the two buckets that interest me the most are liquidity protocols, and then a little bit newer are the idea of synthetic assets. So for li liquidity protocols, uh, obviously Uniswap is a standout, but you have other ones like Kyber Network, Bancor, etc. But Uniswap does something very interesting, and it's a big departure from the way that current financial systems really work. Um, you know, if you're you know, trading on the New York Stock Exchange, you, know, you have market hours, you're, you need a a buyer and seller to exchange for there to actually be trading. Uniswap turns that totally on its head. Uh, no longer do you need that buyer and seller present. No longer do you need to wait for market hours. You can have 24-7 global liquidity uh, that's uh, uh, only incentivizing the people that need to be incentivized, and that's the liquidity providers, and that's very interesting. It also has some very interesting potential network effects. Uh, one thing that we focus on at Delphi is you know, how can like, what is a defensible business or a protocol? How does it build a moat? How does it, you know, resist, you know, some fork of itself coming in and uh, beating it? And, you know, Uniswap is a really in interesting perspective because the way that their uh, automatic, uh, automated market making model works is the more liquidity in a pool, the less price slippage you have on a trade, which is really important, obviously, for trading. Uh, anyone who's ever tried to sell an illiquid token knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so if that can reach a critical mass and have deep liquidity in its pools, uh, it's going to be very hard to kind of, um, you know, get, to compete with that, especially because it doesn't charge an extra fee. There is nothing being skimmed off the top for a company. It's only paying the people that need to be paid. 
And Uniswap is really more than just some website you go to to swap tokens. What gets me excited, and uh, to be fair, Kyber Network's a little farther along at this point than Uniswap, is how you can integrate it into other applications. This isn't, just an you know, this isn't just an exchange where you go and you swap tokens. You can integrate this within dApps, wallets, uh, et cetera, and you can add 24-7 deep liquidity to any application. And that's something where you know, that type of liquidity has never really existed before uh, in traditional financial markets. The other uh, area that really fascinates me are synthetic assets. And you have, a t you have a few projects really kind of building this out right now. You have synthetics and you have UMA. Uh, now, these are pretty complex structures, but just to jump to why they're important, um, you know, investing in financial assets has been one of the better wealth creators uh, you could do. But the problem with it is that, uh, you know, if you're, you know, living in Indonesia, you know, you really can't get exposure to the U.S. stock market if you wanted it. You need brokerage accounts, there's regulatory red tape that gets in your way, but if you could replicate stock market exposure on Ethereum, that really opens up the doors for you know, everyone around the world to play markets in a way that before was never possible. Uh, people always reference like the dot-com bubble and stuff, like, stuff of that nature, uh, but the reason why I always kind of think that you know, this, uh, you know, a future bubble in this space could be even larger is you don't need just a brokerage account to uh, buy this stuff. It's accessible to anybody. And these types of financial products are game changers in, the way that, in a way that has never existed before in the past. Okay. Is DeFi ready to supplant the traditional financial system? No, but uh, it could be eventually. Uh, some of the things that are really important to figure out right now, uh, scaling is a huge holdup, uh, things of that nature. But I do think once we get past that, I do think that DeFi opens the door for incredible financial innovation, uh, boosting financial inclusion, and all of the good economic benefits that come from that uh, if you study history. Now, to talk more about development, I'm going to hand off to my partner, Tom Shaughnessy, who's going to dive into that more. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, I got a couple minutes here to go through kind of expanding on what MJ was talking about with regards to DeFi and centralized finance. So as MJ was talking about, it's still super early for crypto. So this is BTC addresses. Joe, don't shoot me over here, okay? I just couldn't find an ETH one quickly. But it's still super early when you compare crypto to um, the internet. One of the main things I focus on at Delphi is kind of tracking all of the different layer ones that are launching. It's super hard to find the stuff because developers generally don't share it. Uh, but looking ahead, there's dozens of new layer ones planned in the next 12 to 18 months. Everything from Polkadot, uh, Tezos launched uh, recently, Algorand, Hedera, Handshake. These are all different layer ones that are launching, and all of these are going to have to compete to attract developers, attract mindshare, and to MJ's earlier point, to compete on things like DeFi and Web3. Um, it's my opinion that all of these, for second half 2019 and the future, are at a, a huge disadvantage for, for numerous reasons. So, I mean, if you're a VC, this is something you probably think about. Oh, got a new layer one with zillions of dollars in funding with, you know, massive transaction speed. Um, hello, EOS. It's clearly not working. So, I guess the main way I think about this is that each layer one has to not only launch, but they have to attract developers. These developers have to build out different building blocks. Ethereum is known in these, you know, money Legos, things like set or you know, projects like Set use these, and then you have to experiment to create new use cases. I think this is a lot harder than people think, because once you get to the third stage where developers are building the building blocks, all of them can put these together to build new applications. I think it puts new layer ones at a massive multi-year disadvantage, if that makes sense. So you can mix and match all these Legos. So the composability in action set protocol is one we covered. Felix is here as well representing them. It's one of my favorite um, examples of composability in the wild because you're taking Ethereum, Stablecoin DAI, and then Kyber to make different sets that you can trade around that automatically uh, rebalance. This is just an idea of what happens when money Legos are at work. They rele set released all these initial sets, now they have new sets, and you could see just the value locked in them just taking off. Uh, so it, it is pretty powerful in practice. 
I kind of alluded to this earlier, and I'm running out of time here, but I think of this as a huge developer moat for layer one protocols. So the more developers, the more money Legos, the more mind share a network has, the harder it is for a competing network to overtake it because they not only have to release all of the things that the first network built, they have to do it faster and better and attract all those developers. So this is kind of an example of what that can drive in action. Uh, it's really hard to judge Ethereum's developer community from the outside, but Electric Capital did a great report where they found the monthly average developers for Ethereum is four times the competition. Money locked in DeFi is at over 500 million bucks, and Truffle Suite has millions of downloads uh, through consensus. So, <laughs> you know, this is kind of how I think of uh, founders with new layer ones because it's really hard for them to zoom out and see the, the competition that they have. Uh, when I'm thinking about new layer ones launching, I think of Ethereum as its biggest risk. I don't think a new layer one is going to kill Ethereum. I think it's going to be either Ethereum 2.0 doesn't launch, there's a huge bug, um, it fails to maintain its developer community, take your pick. But I seriously doubt that a new layer one can overtake it at this point if we're debating public smart contract platforms. So uh, this is the last meme I'll end on because I'm running out of time. I don't want to go into the other panel, but um, Professor Coins, New Layer Ones, Polkadot, Cosmos with BTC, take your pick. Um, they're fun. They're interesting. There's a lot of exciting news flow there. But I think Ethereum's competing on a different level. I think it's competing on a more mature level. And I just hope people uh, zoom out from time to time and see that. That's all, guys. Thank you.